Listen, I started a series uh, on Easter weekend that we titled The Power of One. Today, we title it The Power of One Failure. Here's what we know in life. We'll all make mistakes. We'll all blow it. We'll all have issues. We'll all have troubles. And maybe not because we, we did anything, just it comes. How many of y'all know sometimes trouble comes knocking on your door when you didn't do anything to get it? It was like, I did nothing. I didn't even go out for a week and it came knocking. <laughs> Things will happen in life and we have to learn and embrace what we call failure because I believe even the way God sees it, he doesn't see it like we call it. And so oftentimes when people fall, they come short, they make a mistake, they make a bad decision... They, they get down on themselves and somehow they think that God doesn't love them or God doesn't care is another thing. And, well, God doesn't care. This would have turned out better. That would have turned out better. And the reality of it, we talk about the power of one failure, how one fa- failure, if you learn from it, can launch you into incredible success. As I talk about this, I'm not only talking about sin. So often in churches, we only talk about sin, but failure comes when you do things right It comes in different avenues. It may have nothing to do with sin. It may just make, I made a bad decision, or I made a bad call, or I said something I shouldn't have said. And so there's so many aspects to this, but we're going to learn how failure can be our friend and is not our enemy. So it only takes one to make a difference. We wonder if we can really make a difference in the lives of others. I'm only one person. But what we need to understand is, or a question is, what power does one person really have? The one man, Adam, in creation, Adam made a decision. One man changed the whole world and launched it into complete chaos. That means complete disorder and confusion. One man, Jesus, came and gave his life for all of us. And we just celebrated that. We celebrated on Good Friday the life he gave, and on Sunday the life that was risen from the dead. And that's what we celebrate, a risen Christ, a God that's alive and real, the only true God. And Jesus came, made a decision, one person, the power of one decision, changed the world forever and gave humanity a way back to God. So how can one choice change someone's life forever? So this series that we're in is designed to help, to help us gain the perspective of the power of one in our lives and, and choices and learning how one decision, one failure, one word, one invite, and one church can have a life-changing impact in our lives and the lives of others. People say it all the time, what can one person do? Well, one person started feeding New Mexico kids. She saw a need. She said these kids are going hungry. She looked up the statistics. The government wasn't taking care of it. The state wasn't. Can I tell you this? The state and the government take care of things that the church was always designed to take care of. We were called to take care of the lost and the hurting, the orphans. But because the church world doesn't do what it needs to do, because so many people refuse to be a part of, the, of God's kingdom and, and give what they're supposed to give and give the time they're supposed to give, the resources they're supposed to give. And I believe one day when we get to heaven, some of us will be accountable. And here's what we'll be accountable for. Because you didn't do your part, the church wasn't able to do this. And I think that's a, that's a sobering mindset to think. And we as the church, when people say, why don't we do more? It's because we don't have the resources we should have. And, and my thought is, is we, we, should, we should help the orphans. You know, my, one of my desires in life, and I don't know if it will ever come to pass, is to buy a hotel in this city, a place like that, fix it up, and all the foster kids that are kicked out of, of the foster care system at 17 and 18, that we could bring them into a place where loving people love God, and they could have a home, and we could make sure they have their education and make sure they go to college and they could live there. And then they would always have some place to come to on Thanksgiving or Christmas, because I know some of you great people in this church would have them to your home. I mean, that's not a bad thing to have or want. And it's, 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 very, it's not selfish. But there are so many children and young, I say children, the older I get, the younger everybody else is. <laughs> I call my daughter, she's 40 now, and I call her a kid, and I said, I know you're not a kid, but at my age, everybody seems younger. 
And the ones that seem older, I just laugh and happy like, you're old, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm in there. But there's so many things we could do if we understood life and we understood what this failure is and how we'd embrace it and, and how we make mistakes and why we make mistakes. But if we understood the heart of God that God truly loves and he cares, why would anybody resist that? So last week we talked about the one decision that Christ made for us on the cross, again, that changed the world. The power of one failure. Proverbs 24, 16 says, The godly may trip seven times, but they will get up again. But one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. That we always get up. No matter what we face, we always get up. We all make mistakes, bad decisions. Everybody in here made a mistake? Bad decision? All right. So we all make mistakes, bad decisions, bad choices at times. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. That means nobody can meet the standard that God put out there, but we're to strive to meet it. In other words, so many people get down on themselves when they blow it. I hear it all the time. Pastor, I made a mistake. I blew it. I felt like God didn't love me anymore. But the reality is we don't live by our feelings because we should know that God said he loved you. And that when we realize that God's not looking for perfection, when people get down on themselves because they failed or made a mistake and they feel like that, okay, now I, I'm not worthy enough to receive God or come to God. You are never worthy enough to, to come to God. God had to make you worthy. It's nothing you did of yourself. It's something Jesus did on the cross. And we've got to get this mindset out of us that, that I walk away because I don't think God would hear me or God would have me. Why would God want me? Because he said he wanted you. Maybe the world has rejected you, but God will never reject you. And that's the reality of understanding this. See, humanity is prone. In fact, it's guaranteed to fail. And every person God ever used in the Bible, has ever used, has blown it from time to time. And the fear of failure is real. In fact, if you study it, research it, and I did a bunch of uh, searches on, on the, the top fears and and basically, when you get to the ones that I think are the most accurate, that the fear of failure is always in the top ten, and it's usually around seven. It, it, it's a real fear that people have, and it stifles them, it paralyzes them, it keeps them from moving forward, and it always lets them look in the past instead of looking to the bright future. And so we need to understand that fear of failure is real. And what we need to understand, it is a part of our growth, that failure is a part of our growth. As a Christian or as a person, we need to learn to learn from our mistakes and learn to recover well. You know, in the 1980s, they built this thing, scientists did a biodome, they called it. And it was this glass thing, and they, they made the environment perfect for growth. They made the environment perfect for vegetation and vegetables and trees and, and humanity and animals. They created a perfect environment. But what stifled the scientists at a time was when the trees grew they begin at a certain size, they begin to fall over. And they were baffled. They were like, man, we created this perfect environment, but these trees, when they get to a certain size, they're falling over because, and here's what they discovered, that those trees, in order to survive and maintain the weight of who they, how they grow, they had to have some resistance. And the resistance the trees get is the wind. And as the wind comes, the resistance of the, the come, their roots get stronger and deeper so the bigger they get, the more erect they stand. And in life, you and I have to have some resistance in our life in order to grow and mature as a person, as a believer, as just as an individual. We, we need that resistance. But so oftentimes we think if we have any resistance in our life that God doesn't care, God doesn't love me. Why would God let this happen? And God is always intended to cause you to grow. And it's through these times of resistance that we grow the most. The times of mistakes, the time that we call failures, those things, it will cause us to grow it will, it will, if, if we embrace it. For some, it, it just shipwrecks you because you don't understand it. And whether you believe it or not, God loves you. Well, what if he loves me, why am I going through this? Maybe you need to learn something. I don't believe he's the author of it, but in it you can learn. Because without resistance, we, we have no stamina. And you need stamina to live in this world, especially this crazy world. We live in a crazy world today. And so we've got to understand and we've got to learn to recover well. 
See, failure is an event. It's not a destiny. Albert Hubbard said, the greatest mistake you can make in life is to be continually fearing you will make one. For a lot of people, fear of failure, making a mistake is a real issue. And not understanding how God grows us and proves us and matures us is the reason that we, we think that way. If you failed in life, welcome to humanity. If you've made a mistake, welcome. Well, I've made so many mistakes, God would never love me. That is such a bogus statement. Everybody know what bogus means? Is that an old term? I went back in my world, didn't I? It's, a, it's such a false statement. It's a false thinking. It's a false theology. Because, folks, if your life was perfect like so many want it to be, you would have zero need of God. Why would you need God if it was perfect? If my life was perfect, why would I need God? Oh, we still need him. Really? How often? Because most people call on him when there's problems. I mean, thank God they call on him. And when you want a perfect life, you're missing what God said is going to happen. He never promised you a perfect life. And so often people say, you know, that's how they react. That's how they moan and groan and pout and whine. It's like, why this? And it's not fair. That terminology needs to leave your thinking and your words in your mouth. Because life is not fair. But how do people develop such resilience in their life that they go through such horrific things and come out and they're doing okay? They're still moving forward because they have learned that God grows us and matures us through the times when we have resistance. And at times when you're walking with God, you'll do the right thing and get, the, and get a bad outcome. In Genesis 50, verse 20, this is talking about Joseph. He's talking to his brothers, and everybody knows the story of Joseph. Let me give you a recap. Joseph had a dream and decided to tell his brothers, I had a dream, and my dream was that you guys bowed down to me, and they're like, you know, bigger brothers are like, boy, we're never going to bow down to you. Who do you think you are? And then, the God, then their father gave Joseph such great favor, and they saw it. And so one day, they went out to do something. Joseph's dad said, go check on the, your brothers. They went. The brothers saw him come and said, we're going to kill this guy. And the oldest brother said, we're not going to kill him. We'll throw him in this, in this, this uh, hole in the ground. And then, we'll, and then they, they were deciding what to do. And a caravan came, and they sold him into slavery. Now, what has he done wrong? Do you think God still loves him? But the way we think in our world, no, God couldn't love him. Why would he let that happen if he loved him? Because God knew what, he, what the plan for him was. And here's what we do in America today. We seek our plan in our ways and very little talk about seeking God's plan and his ways for our life. It was God's plan all along. Joseph goes, he's sold into slavery into Potiphar's house. He's, he becomes the head of the house. Potiphar sees everything this guy touches that prospers. And, and Potiphar's wife must have been a beautiful woman. And she, she, she looked at Joseph. Joseph must have been a pretty handsome dude. And she kept coming after Joseph. And one day Joseph went into her bedchambers, I guess. And, and she looked and she said, come here, baby. <laughs> oh, baby, oh, baby, oh, come on. And Joseph said, nah, man, you know, man, it's wrong. You're Potiphar's wife. It's wrong before God. And she was like, I don't care. Come here. And he decided to run, and before he ran, she reached out and grabbed his garment and whatever that was that men wore then, and, and he ran, and he ran out naked. So when Potiphar came home, his wife seemed distressed. What's wrong? She basically says, Joseph was trying to have sex with me. He basically was trying to rape me. So Potiphar went to Joseph, knew it probably wasn't true, but he threw him into prison. Can I say this? Joseph's reward for doing the right thing was prison. Does God love him? I mean, does God love Joseph or has he been abandoned? Joseph still served God. And what you and I got to understand when we go through troubles and problems, it doesn't have anything to do with God loving us or not. That God will take anything that's meant for evil and turn it around for our good and your glory if you continually believe in him. And sometimes I believe God leads us to the fire so we can grow and mature. It's not meant to harm us. It's meant to grow us up. People say, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Well, he led Jesus into the fire. 
If he would lead Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, don't you think he'd lead you into some places that are hot spots and aren't all, you know, roses and sweet and nice? Like, man, I, all these people I meet are so nice. He might lead you in a place where you think all these people I meet are awful. So that was Joseph's reward. He went to prison, interpreted some dreams. They forgot about him. Finally, they remembered him. And then he became the second in command. And here's what he says to his brothers. When his brothers are like, Joseph, I know we did you wrong. Here's what he said. I love this. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. What you intended or what the devil or what the world intends for evil, God intended it for his good. And so he looks back and says, I know it was off. I was a slave. I was in prison. Those prisons weren't like these prisons. And now I'm second in command. Not only did God intend it to save the lives of many, he intended to save his own family's life. But what we do at times, we allow the root of bitterness to well up in our hearts and minds. We, we allow thoughts to come that are so ungodly that are, we got to recognize they're not from God. And we think if we have any obstacles that, oh my gosh, God, why is this happening? Because it may need to happen. You may need to go through some fire to get to the other side because fire purifies. And that when you come out, you should be more mature, handling yourself better, walking different, treating others differently. Because when you think like, well, God doesn't love me or this is too hard or it's not fair, you're not thinking biblically. You're about your own life, not God's life in you. Whew. I had to breathe at that one. See, because some of us feel like failures, even though we have done some things right. We believe the obstacles we face means we fail. But as you walk with God, it could just mean growth. Yeah, but pastor, I blew it on this one. So what? Welcome to the club. Welcome to the club of people who have blown it. But we learn from that and we pick ourselves up and we try not to make the same mistake again. Albert Einstein said this. I love this. Failure is success in progress. You know, I had a doctor tell me recently that he said, when you work out, and, and just because you're, you, you, um, you look like you're in shape doesn't mean you're healthy. But he says, how you know if you're healthy or if you're in really good shape is your recovery time. How long does it take you to recover? That determines what kind of shape you're in. And can I tell you this? In life, when you get knocked down, knocked around, beat up, whatever, pushed around, if your recovery time takes forever, you're probably not in that great of shape. But the less recovery time it takes for you to recover, the more shape you're in, the more mature you are, and the more godly you've become. And that's how we measure it. What is your recovery time when obstacles come, when things happen? See, I want to talk a bit uh, for a moment about some people who have failed, but understood it didn't, and it never did define them. So when he was about 15 years old, Jack Andraka had a crazy idea at 15 that he would create a diagnostic test for pancreatic cancer that was better than the test developed by scientists, research labs, and billion-dollar pharmaceutical companies. Jack wrote a proposal to develop a better test. And 199, everybody say 199. 199 research labs rejected him. 199 times he was told no and, and was totally rejected. Most people say, well, you're a fail. You failed. Didn't work. You need to give up. But the good thing he didn't give up because the 200th research lab at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore accepted him. At the lab, Jack Adraka developed a pancreatic cancer test 100 times better and 26,000 times less expensive than the current test. And Jack's invention 
will save tens of thousands of lives because he didn't see the first 199 rejection notes or failure. He said, no, I'm never going to give up. It made him better, not weaker. Michael Jordan, considered by many as probably the best basketball or greatest basketball player of all time, was devastated when he was cut from his high school varsity basketball team his sophomore year. And it's a good thing failure only inspired him to work harder. Here's what he said about failure. I have missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I have lost almost 300 games. On 26 occasions, I have been entrusted to take the game-winning shot, and I missed. I have failed over and over and over again in my life. And then he ends with this, and that is why I succeed. Steve Jobs, who everybody knows him, was fired at one time from the company he founded, Apple. He also failed with Next Computer Company, and I think it says in the Lisa Computer. And when, but when Jobs returned to Apple, he led the business to become the most profitable company in the U.S. How many of y'all have an iPhone? You ought to thank God he didn't quit. He failed. He was fired and failed at two different other places and came back to be successful. Why? Because if you embrace failure, learn from it, you grow from it, and you make yourself better. You become better, stronger. Resistance makes me stronger, not weaker. No one wanted to hire Walt Disney. They didn't want to hire him as an artist. In fact, he couldn't get hired anywhere. So his brother got him a temporary job. And then Walt's first animation studio went bankrupt. Most people be like, oh God, if you love me, why'd it go bankrupt? Because he probably didn't know some things that he learned. Are you hearing me? He went on to co-found the Walt Disney Company, which had in the year 2012 over $40 billion in revenue. Thank God he didn't quit. Thank God he didn't see failure as final or permanent, just as an event. Steven Spielberg was, I love this one, Steven Spielberg was rejected both times he applied to attend film school at the University of Southern California, USC. But that didn't stop him. Spielberg has now grossed over $8.5 billion from films he directed. Oh, and here's another part. After Spielberg became famous, USC awarded him an honorary degree, and Spielberg later became a trustee of the university. No, you're not good enough to be in our school, but that didn't deter him. I don't care how many no's you get. I don't care how many mistakes you make. I don't care how many failures you think you have. The key is, what are you going to do with them? Are they going to sideline you? Or are they going to make you get up and get in the game and play harder and work smarter and learn from them? Charles Schultz, most of you know him as the Peanuts, uh, a character, Snoopy and Charlie Brown. Charles Schultz's drawings were rejected by his high school yearbook. Schultz went on to create Peanuts featuring Snoopy and, and Charlie Brown, the cartoon and licensing product. Revenue from Peanuts generated over $1 billion a year. The high school eventually put a statue of Snoopy in the main office. <laughs> Mary Kay Ash sold books door to door while her husband served in the military. When her husband returned from duty, they divorced. Ash was left with three children at a time when divorce wasn't acceptable at all. Ash was frustrated when passed over for a promotion because she was a woman at her job. So she and her second husband planned a business, Mary Kay Cosmetics. One month prior to launch, her husband died. Are you kidding me? Are you hearing this? People have issues. With a $5,000 investment from her oldest son, Ash launched her business, and Forbes reported in 2014 that the revenue was over $3.5 billion. Now, this one man I'm going to quote, I don't really care for personally, that's my disclaimer. But he said this, I've learned that it doesn't matter how many times you failed, you only have to be right once. I tried to sell powdered milk. I was an idiot lots of times, and I learned from them all. Mark Cuban, billionaire entrepreneur 
that owns the Dallas Mavericks. So everybody that's successful has failed. They just never let failure define them. And they didn't wallow in their pity. And they didn't lay down very long. They learned to get back up and grow and develop and become the person that they needed to be. And so in order for us to truly see the power of one failure and what it can do in our lives, we have to understand what failure is not. So failure is not avoidable. Failure is not your enemy. And failure is never final. So we cannot avoid failure. If you live in life, you can't avoid it. Failure is a learning experience so we can do better the next time. Determination and failure leads to success. You fail, you get up, and you try again. If, you're, if your heart is right, and especially walking with God, you will eventually get it right. I love this scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. We are pressed on every side by troubles. How many of y'all feel that way? at times the Bible says so we are pressed on every side by troubles but we are not crushed we are perplexed but not driven to despair we are hunted down but never abandoned by God we get knocked down but we are not destroyed folks God is trying to teach us that this is how life's going to treat you but you got to understand who you serve and you got to understand the power of one failure can launch you into incredible success if you don't quit, if you don't stop. Paul reminds all of us, even though we think we are at the end of our rope, we are never at the end of our hope. See, all, all of our risks, humiliations, trials, are opportunities for all of us, for God to demonstrate his power towards us. Think about it if you never had any pain in your life ever you wouldn't be able to love or care for people just think if you didn't have troubles and problems you would need never learn how to be an overcomer just think if you if you never had setbacks if you never failed how would you ever understand and trust in God you see, we're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to fail at times. We're all going to blow it. But it's what we do with those things. Do they define me? Or are they just part of the journey? What is it? How do we see it? How do we view God? Are our problems so much bigger than him or is he bigger than all of them? You see, you have to ask yourself, what are you going to do with it? Because you're going to experience it at some point time or another number two failure is not your enemy see it fosters growth in our lives if we allow it the power of one failure finds the opportunity to learn and grow every time every failure leaves us in the place to learn it's how you view it it is not your enemy when we learn from our mistakes it can really become a friend how many of you look back in your life and think Man, because that happened, it caused me to change course and do something better. Yeah, see, we have to learn that it's not our enemy. Psalms 119.71 says, as I love these scriptures, My suffering was good for me, for it taught me to pay attention to your decrees. Jeremiah 8.4 says, Jeremiah, say to the people, this is what the Lord says. When people fall down, don't they get up again? And when they discover they're on the wrong road, don't they turn back? Don't they go on? I'm on the wrong road. i got to turn and go on the right road. And number three, failure is not final. Nor is failure the end. Because God is always the God of another chance. The power of one failure reminds us all of the power of God's forgiveness. Because without failure, we'd never know God's forgiveness. Without making a mistake, we would never know. And failure teaches us not to expect perfection from others or ourselves. And it helps us gain the Father's heart of compassion. Years ago, my wife and I encountered something that really hurt us. And as I was walking through it, because I'd never really had any pain. I mean, my dad died. That was the greatest pain I've ever had in my life. But with my kids, my family and that, I just never had any pain. I just, nothing ever went wrong. And I'm not wishing it did go wrong. But 
What can I learn when something doesn't go right? And our hearts were broken. And from that day on to this, I have developed a greater compassion for people. That at times I would look and people would say, oh, my kids are doing this. And I would think in my mind, I wouldn't say it, but I'd think in my mind, well, if you raised them better, they'd be okay. Because that's what we do as Christians. But now I never think that, I never say that. My heart breaks with them. Because you can raise them the right way, do everything right, and still not get a good result at the beginning. You'll get one eventually. I believe that. But you don't always get one. And so it gave me a greater heart for compassion for people and the things they go through and their heartbreak. You see, it taught me something. Even though I don't believe God was the author of it, He didn't want it to happen, it happened. And sometimes when you do the right thing, you, you don't always get the, the right result. That's why you have to trust God. That's why you have to believe in Him, that His plan is bigger than your plan. Years ago, my wife and I moved to Roswell, America. From, I, I took her from Tulsa, Oklahoma to Roswell, America. Some of people always ask, why do you call it that? I say, because it's not the end of the world, but I've seen the end of the world from there. <laughs> I'm just not a small town guy. People are great. Usually when I say that, I always meet someone that's from Roswell, like, I'm from Roswell. But we went there, and I, I remember we moved my whole family. I had, a, I had three children. My daughter was going to be a junior in high school. My two young ones were in kindergarten and second grade. They told me they could pay me a certain amount. I quit my job. And, uh, and when I quit my job, my boss, you know, took 30, 45 minutes for him to let me quit. Because he said, Steve, we, we don't have people walk in and quit that have been here as long as you. He said, we fire people that have been here as long as you, but we don't have them quit. And so I'd start to sign. He'd pull it away. And he said, what are you going to do again? I said, well, I'm going to go pastor a church in Roswell, America. I was so pumped. I probably called it Roswell, New Mexico back then because I wasn't there yet. <laughs> and, then, and then he would take it back. The slip, he goes, now, you know when you sign this, you can never come back. And I said, yeah. And so I started signing. He'd take it back. He said, you realize UPS will never hire you again. You can't just leave and come back and think we're going to hire. We will never hire, ever. You will never get hired again. And I said, yes, and he was just concerned. It was nice, but he was concerned. So I signed the thing, so I was done. I didn't have a job to come back to. Then we moved to Roswell, and we think it's God, right? God, God opened this door. Come on. God opened it. We get there, and we look in the checkbook, and it's minus 500. There's no money. In fact, the books were so bad that my mom, who was a vice president at the Citizens Bank for a while, for a long time, she and my wife looked at them, and they were so bad that they took them to an accountant, and the accountant said, you are not responsible for, for these books. They're so bad, you need to don't throw them away, file them away, start new books, and if the IRS ever comes knocking, you just say, I had nothing to do with that because they're that bad. And then they had no money. They promised us a house that the church owned a house, and you can live in that. So I thought, okay, we got a decent house because I saw it. Then when I got there, the house wasn't there. Something happened. They lost it, and they had no money. And I have a wife and three children. I just left a great job. Now, was it God or not? Because most people would say, God, if you love me, why would this happen? God, if you love me, why would you lead me into this? And i tell you why. At 33 years old, I needed to grow up. And I had to think, do I run back to Tulsa and try to get a job? Or do I stick this out? And do I learn to fight? Do I learn to scrap? And do I learn to scrape? And do I learn to just keep believing when everything in you says no? And on top of that, we moved there. It's God. I believe it was God. Our house gets broken into three times. We'd never had our house broken into three times. They thought it was called stop and shop. <laughs> it, it, it caused my wife, it, it caused fear in her. It just caused me to get ticked off like, man. So I got, I've heard, so I've, I got a DNA dog, a Doberman Pinscher. And if you come in my backyard again, I'm going to get a blood sample. That's all I know. That's all I care about. <laughs> Our car broke down. Everything just happened. And I was thinking, God, this can't be you. I must have missed it. But I didn't miss it. God would say, what are you going to do with it? You're being troubled on every side. Can I just, I'm going to put it bluntly. I basically think God just said to me, you got to suck it up, Steve. you got to suck it up right here. And you have to trust me or don't trust me. And through those times that I thought it was a mistake, I thought we blew it, we learn to trust God. We need to understand that failure will lead to success if you understand it. Getting things right, if we are willing to pick ourselves up and keep moving forward. Philippians 3.13, and I begin to close. No, dear brothers and sisters, 
I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. And if you're always looking backwards, you're going to run into things. you got to let some stuff go back here and move forward and say, I'll learn from it, but I'm not going to live in it. Psalms 37, 24, though they stumble, I love this, they will never fall for the Lord holds them by the hand. It doesn't matter what you have done. God is bigger than all your sins and all your mistakes and all your failures. Here's one of my favorite scriptures. To this day, I meditate on this scripture more than any other scripture. And we know. Everybody say, we know. We don't wonder. We don't have to think about. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. If you'll walk through the trials of life, the mistakes, the failures, it'll make you stronger if you keep getting up and keep moving forward and keep walking with God. Allow failure to be your friend. Learn from them. Forget the past, the pain of them. Learn, grow, and develop, and move forward. And here's the final thing. I told you what failure is not. Here's what failure really is. True failure is when you give up, and you quit, and you stop. Other than that, it's called a journey. It's called working your salvation out with fear and trembling. That's what it's called. That's, that's what God says. And so when you think you're a failure, you're not a failure. You're just in a growth process. You're learning. And sometimes we learn through pain, don't we? I'd rather learn through your pain, though. When people say, hey, I did this. It didn't work out too good. I'm like, well, I'm never going to do that. And can I tell you, even people that are successful sometimes have the fear of failure. But as Christians... You can't fail God. God will take whatever is meant for evil, intended to harm you, and turn it around for your good. If you believe, if you trust, if you decide I'm going to move forward, failure is simply giving up. And maybe you're in this place and you've given up. Maybe you're here, but you've given up. Maybe you walk with the Lord, but you walked away. You're tired. You, you didn't understand. He felt abandoned by God, but yet he said he'll never reject you or abandon you. He's always been there. But it's time for you to come home. It's time for you to get it right. It's time for you to pick yourself up. Because quitters are quitters as long as they want to be. But if you've given up, all it takes you a moment is to get up, get up off the floor. Get up. It doesn't take long. If you're laying down and quit, just get up and start again because God's always there to help you and learn from that. People tell me all the time, you know, they backslide for years and they say, Pastor, I just want to get back to the place I was. And I said, no, I don't think you want to do that. They said, oh, yes, I do. And I said, no, you don't. And they said, why? And I said, because where the place you were caused you to backslide. Hopefully you want to come to a place where you're further along so you never walk away from God again. Maybe you're here and you have never given God permission to your life. Never. You've never invited him in. And people say, if God wants me saved, he'll just save me. That's a lie too. Because my Bible says you've got to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. You have to give God permission to your life. He's a perfect gentleman. He's not going to force his way into your world. You've got to invite him and say, God, I want you in my world. I want you in my life. That's how it works. And if that's you, this is your moment. With every head bowed, folks, listen. If, if you're here and you've walked with God or, or you've never invited God, this is your moment. I'm not going to call you forward out of your seats, but I'm going to pray with you right where you're seated. And if that's you in Jesus' name right now, I'm going to ask you to do a couple things, but right at your seat. It's not hard, but I want to know. And I think you need to be able to say, God, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I just want you in my life. If that's you and you say, Pastor, include me in your prayer right now in the powerful name of Jesus, right where you're seated, would you just lift your hand? All of us have to humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God. If the ushers will help me as they look around, I'm going to look around. If you just lift your hand and say, Pastor, include me in your prayer. Today's my day. I'm coming home. I'm going to get this right. I'm going to get my thinking right. As I look across the top, is there anybody up there that says, Pastor, thank you. God bless you. As I look across the top continually, ushers, if you'll help me because I can't see up there sometimes. Just lift your hand. Thank you. God bless you. As I look across the bottom, saying, who would join? And say, okay, God bless you. I see those hands. God loves people, guys. 
You'll never experience, thank you, God bless you. You'll never experience the love of God until you say yes to him. Thank you, God bless you. You say, pastor, but it makes me a little uncomfortable. Well, it's when you get moved out of your comfort zone that you really come to know life. Because so many of us just want to stay in our comfort zone. And every one of us has to come the same way to God, humbly. So many people say, let's receive Christ. I've changed that. If you're willing, with all your heart, to submit to the will of God, to purpose to do what He asks and learn His word and learn His ways, this is for you. If you just want to say a prayer to think you have some fire insurance or hell insurance, that doesn't work. That's a myth. But if you're willing to submit your will to His, say, God, I'm just going to learn your ways and I'm going to do it. Then this is for you. Anybody else before we close? Thank you. God bless you. Who else? I don't want to miss anybody. Father, in the powerful name, thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for each one that lifted their hand. I thank you they'll never be the same because of you. I thank you, Father, that you desire for us to humble ourselves before you, to, to, to not care what anybody else thinks, but just to, to do what's right, that we want you working in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds. So, Father, bless each one. In Jesus' name. Now, before I pray, I want to see who I'm praying for. So if you lifted your hand, I want you to stand right at your seat. That's all I'm asking you to do. You don't have to come down here. I just want you to stand. And one will stand. Usually everybody will stand. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll look across. Thank you, ma'am. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, God loves people, guys. And this will free you. This will be a freeing moment because when you leave and you go out in a world where people don't want you, don't care about God, you'll be able to stand because it just frees you up. Father, in Jesus' name, you see all the folks standing that they'll never be the same because of you. I pray blessings upon each and every one of them in Jesus' name. If you're standing, I want you to pray this prayer loud with me. I, I want you to pray loud enough for your ears to hear your voice. If, if you're... If you're right with God already, let's pray because I'm going to lead you to Christ. Only Jesus can save you. The church can't save you. Only Jesus. Would you pray this prayer with me aloud? Would you pray, Father, I believe in Jesus. And I believe He's your Son. And I believe He is Lord of all. Jesus, be Lord of my life. And I willingly, from this moment, submit my will to your will. To do what you ask me to do. Teach me your ways, O oh God, that I might know you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's thank God for him, church, if you would.